you said, I have struggled with quitting and I have not been able to yet. That's the problem. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 181, and I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening and watching wherever you're coming from. The format of this podcast, what we do is just sit around and talk, answering your questions. Could be about any subject, anything in the world. Just just email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com, and we walk through it like we're just two people sitting in the cab of a truck, driving on a long road trip, got the windows down, your elbow out. You go, hey man, could I, could I ask you a question? Something that's been on my mind lately. And then we walk through it like we got all the time in the world. And I don't have notes in front of me. I don't have famous quotes. I don't have books. I haven't even read the questions at all. I'm going completely blind off of the email, grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Let's get to the first one. Subject line here says mistakes. It says, hey Granger, my name is Duke. I'm from Southern California. Just wondering if you ever make mistakes while singing at a concert. I have never been to any concert, so I don't even know if that's a thing to sometimes mess up. I assume you play a ton, so maybe it's hard to mess up. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever gotten a question like that, Duke. I appreciate you. Shout out to Southern Cali. And um, the answer, I mean, yeah, I mess up a lot. Mess up all the time. I've, I've played... Thousands of shows in my life. It's crazy to think about. But if you think about 150 shows a year for decades, you do that enough, you mess up enough. The the thing about it is, most of the time, no one even knows that I mess up, except for maybe the hardcore fans and the band. The band will always know. We always know when one of us messes up. And so we usually will look like Todd will do a note he's never done before on guitar and I'll look out of the corner of my eye and he's looking back at me because he knows that I'm looking at him. We're like brothers, you know, it's like brotherly love. It's like, man, you know, you knew I did that, didn't you? Of course. We speak the same language on the stage. Me and the band, we know each other without saying words. We know everything we do. We know the looks, we know the, the notes, we know the drum beats, everything. We know if someone is doing something different because we've done it so many times. Most of the time, the fans don't know. Sometimes one mistake from one band member leads to another mistake from another band member because muscle memory gets messed up. You're used to hearing this pattern of events happen and it triggers something in your brain. You play this because of all these things. And when those things don't happen, you stumble. It's very strange how that happens if you do it so many times in a row. Sometimes the fans do know, and sometimes, you know, some mistakes are worse than others. Most of the time it revolves around me forgetting lyrics. Um, every once in a while you could start the song in the wrong key. That's like a once every 10 year mistake, but there, there are a, a lot of things. There's a lot of technical problems. Microphones run out of batteries. Uh, cables go bad. Stages break. Lights turn off. Generators blow. Power goes out. Uh, there's all those kind of things. The thing about me is we've played so many shows for so many years that I've seen every kind of mistake. And that's a great thing because I I could say to myself, well, I've played bigger shows than this and messed it up. (laughs) You know, I've played bigger shows than this on less sleep. I've played bigger shows than this and been sicker than I am now. You know, so I've, I've kind of done all the all the combinations of bad things, I've seen it happen. And that, that gives me a sense of calm, really. And that, that could be applied to anyone that's listening that has done something enough times. You can calm yourself by saying, I've, I've messed up in bigger situations than this. I've had my foot in my mouth in bigger conversations than this. And there's something very freeing about that. And so the best thing to do when I make a mistake just own it instead of trying to act like I'm better than a mistake. Man, I'm, I make mistakes all the time and I just own it. It's a good question though, Duke. Next question, septic line says, Bible question. It says, hey, Granger, in a previous email, you said that you believed all people that are alive on the earth right now will 
have a human death before Jesus returns. Could you make a clarification on why you believe this and why you're certain of that? Secondly, could you clarify why, clarify why you believe most of what John the Revelator describes in the book of Revelation has already happened, as well as what could have as well as what could have the animal symbolism that John uses could have occurred in recent history. I read that exactly like you wrote it. As well as what could have the animal animal symbolism that John uses could have occurred in recent history. Reg- regards anonymous. Okay, anonymous. Yeah, let's dive into this. Um, I'm going to say one thing right off the bat. I didn't. I didn't say what I'm uh, what I'm accused of saying here. You said, I heard in a previous previous podcast, you said that all people that are alive on earth right now will have a human death before Jesus returns. I did not say that because it's impossible. And I wouldn't have said something uh, that is impossible to know. Um, it's like Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon, how could he, anyone even know that? Um, no one can know that. So I... I, I, what I said was, probably knowing me, um, I probably said something like, most likely, 99% chance or something like that, most likely all people that are alive on earth right now will not see Jesus return in the way that John describes it in the book of Revelation. Okay? Is that so wrong to say that? Is that so wrong to say? Here's the deal. Jesus, what we're talking about here is eschatology. Eschatology is one of the most debated, one of the most confusing things in the entire Bible. It's the study of end times. And the the thing about it is, is when Jesus came to earth, right? God had the Abrahamic covenant. Then he had the Mosaic covenant. When Jesus came, when, when the Word became flesh in John 1, right? The Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the covenant. He became the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant was to show people who God is and to give them the rules on what was expected of them. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the law and fulfilled all the law of the prophets, including the Abrahamic covenant. He became, then he became what people needed to turn to instead of themselves. Abraham's covenant was based on faith. That's what Jesus fulfilled. So here's the deal. The people before that The people of God were based on genealogy, on the bloodline. When Jesus came, the definition of God's people changed. It became new. God didn't change. The definition of the people became new. And the new definition of the people was, how do you respond to the Son? It was based on your response to the Son of God. Okay. So we're moving through this. What happened in that time? Here's my point, Anonymous. What happened in that time when the Word became flesh? The end times dawned. The the birth of Christ, when the Word became flesh, the end of times dawned. That was the beginning of the end of times. We are still living in it. It's been 2,000 years. So from that day, everyone thought at some point, hey, maybe Jesus is coming back today. Maybe he's coming back tomorrow. Maybe he's coming back in my lifetime. For 2,000 years, people have said that and thought that. There's technically nothing wrong with a hopeful eschatology in that way. Reading Revelation, specifically looking to the sky for yourself, it's kind of fun, okay? it can become an obsession. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. And I I got a feeling, brother, I got a feeling through your email, the tone of your email, that this is a problem for you. And that's why I speak up about this in this podcast, because I I used to fall in, in high school, 
I used to study this stuff and get really into it and look at the signs and be really into the signs and thinking Jesus is going to come back. And I did it in a way that's not healthy. See how I, how I said that? It's not that it's unhealthy for you or anyone else, but I was doing it in a way that becomes unhealthy because you start thinking about all that stuff and you start adding up these signs and, you know, these prophecies and you start putting it, you know, aligning it with like world events and global leaders and things that are going on in the, in the culture and you start trying to add it up and like decipher it when Jesus says, no one knows. No one knows. No one will know. That's what he says. He didn't say no one will know except for the smart people that put all the puzzle together. He said no one's going to know. It doesn't matter if you get the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and you put all the prophecies together and, and then line them up with, with the United States and then China and then the, the, the new state of Israel in 1946 and you, you add all this stuff up. He just said no one's going to know. Why does he say get ready? Why does he say be ready? Not so that you could add up to the date. It's so that you could get your, yourself ready. You could be aware. Right? And so I think you can get lost in eschatology and the science of it, if that's a thing. You can get lost in that and forget that the whole purpose is your response to Jesus through faith in him. Because, brother, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you will die on this earth before that happens. How do I know that? I don't. But that's just math. It's just probability. Because people have been saying it for 2,000 years. Oh, you say, now's different. Now's different. We got COVID. We got AI. We got wars. We got earthquakes. We got... Brother, this has always happened. This has been happening for a long time. Don't get caught up in it. It can mess you up. It starts, it starts deviating you from the truth. Jesus is the truth. Trust him. Don't worry about the, the signs. That's a wicked generation that looks after the signs. You'll know in your heart because of the fruits that you produce in your life. You'll know if you're in right standing. And only God can do that. Focus on that. Focus on loving others, serving others, spreading the Great Commission to all the nations. Worry about that. And not Fox News and CNN and what's happening in Russia. Don't dive into that. It becomes unhealthy. I've talked way too much about it. That's my point. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, next question here. Published songwriting. Hey, Granger, my name is Travis. I'm 28 years old, single with zero dependence. I live in Georgia outside of work. I have a passion for creating, writing, storytelling that I believe God has instilled in me. As of a few years ago, I've taken a deep interest in writing traditional country songs after they started randomly, randomly coming up in my mind. I am not a performer, but I've enjoyed fleshing out the lyrics and practicing singing with them and with my acoustic. I soon plan on demoing them to blank disc. It's not much, but it's what I could do for now. Forgive my ignorance and loaded questions, but there's much about the Nashville grind and Music Row publishing companies that I just don't understand as an outsider, and I'm really ashamed to ask, but here goes. Is it possible for writers to submit demos that they've made to publishing companies like novelists do or reach out to them in any way without being summoned via recommendation? Are all songwriters under contract session writers as well, or do the sum work alone and continuously submit their finished work whilst under contract? I don't in intend to sound wishful or disrespectful in any way by asking. The waters are rough and chances are minuscule to quote everything that glitters is not gold. There are certain things a man just doesn't know. If you decide to read this, thank you so much for allowing the unique opportunity with your personal time. You're the man. Christ is king. Thanks for everything. Sorry about the length. All right, brother. I appreciate you, man. 
uh, Travis, 28 years old. Travis, you speak like an older man. Like you got a wise soul to you, brother. Um, shout out to Georgia. Love that state. And let's dive in here. First thing I'm going to recommend to you is talking with a performance rights organization. It's a PRO, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. You've probably heard of those, or maybe you've seen the little stickers on a restaurant or a music venue, little little sticker that says BMI or ASCAP or CSAC. Um, talk to them. What they do is they represent the songwriters, and they get the songwriters paid based on how many times that song has performed worldwide in all media. That could be at a music venue or a restaurant, like we just mentioned. could be on the radio. could be in a jukebox. It used to be a really big thing. Um, and every other way that a song can perform and pay the songwriter. So that's their whole job. And they're there for the writers. And so they, they are staffed up to handle people like you to answer your questions. They can be the go-between between a publisher and the writer. They were for me a long, long, long time ago when I first did this. Uh, I signed with BMI. It doesn't, there's no requirement. There's no test or, or audition. Anyone could sign with BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC, and uh, you're a, then you're a BMI writer. And you could use the the privileges that you get from being uh, with that specific PRO. So um, I'll start there. And, and aside from that, you're 28 years old, you love songwriting, man, just write a lot and put it on YouTube. It's an amazing time to be a songwriter because this is something I didn't have when I was 28. You could just throw it up on the internet, on TikTok, Twitter or YouTube, whatever, Spotify, you can get every song up right now uh, through different different platforms. It's super easy. It's amazing. You could start getting traction on YouTube right away. Uh, that's something that you have an advantage on every other songwriter that lived in the decades past. So I wouldn't worry so much about publishing companies and songwriting contracts. There's not much money in that anyway. So I wouldn't think about it. Um, what's going to happen is you get a song that goes viral on YouTube because it's just a great song. You're going to have any publishing company in Nashville wanting to sign you because of that. So focus on that. Don't get the cart in front of the horse. You know what I mean? If you go sign with a random publishing company, which is near impossible to do, Jesus will come back before you go out and just get randomly get a publishing contract. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's an extreme. I'm tying the two questions together here. But it's it's just the way it is. It's very, very difficult to get a publishing contract if no one knows you and you don't know anyone and you don't even know how to get your music on a disc, which, by the way, doesn't happen anymore. You don't, you don't get music on disc anymore, brother. That's, I, that doesn't happen. They go, they go digital on YouTube. So let's, let's, get to, let's get to recording. Let's get that guitar out. Let's learn a, a simple... Recording software like Pro Tools, like I'm literally using right now, staring at the screen off camera, looking at Pro Tools. I've been using this since 2002. I got my first Pro Tools set up in 2002. That's a long time ago. That's like 21 years ago, right? So um, learn something like that. Recording software on your computer. Get a couple microphones. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Put one on your on your guitar, one on your vocal, and record you some songs and get them up on social media if one goes viral now you got something to talk about let's take a break be right back podcast is brought to y'all today by game time you know it's so stressful getting tickets and me being in the concert business it's so difficult to watch people wondering how they're going to get tickets or trying to find tickets last minute. And I know the feeling if I'm, if I'm going to like a football game with Lincoln and I want him to enjoy this game, the last thing I want to do is deal with tickets that I can't find last minute. Yeah, it could be pretty stressful. But here's where game time comes in. They are fast and an easy way to buy tickets for all music, sports, comedy, theaters near you. 
They got killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You know, you could stop stressing over all the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you're going to have. I'm sitting here looking at the Game Time app right now. You just, there's like tabs on the top and it says discover, sports, music, shows. And you, and so I just hit music and then bam, it comes up. Chris Stapleton is playing on Friday at the Moody Center. And then next Sunday, Kiss is playing. It has her tickets and then you could tap on it. Boom, Chris Stapleton. And boom, there it is. I could pick the exact seat I want to go to. Here's the upper deck. In fact, since it's last minute, uh, this concert is tomorrow. Um, there's no lower deck. So yeah, there's some lower decks right there. They're just a little bit more expensive, but it's super easy to sit here and browse and grab these tickets and I don't have to think about it anymore. Did you know it's the fastest growing ticket app in the country for a reason? You get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You could buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you don't have to sit there and dig through your email and go print out everything. It's just right there on your phone. It's so nice. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Granger for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Granger for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Back to the podcast. Back to the podcast. If you got a question for me, email GrangerSmithPodcast at gmail.com. I'm happy to add it to the queue here and pull up an email. I don't study these questions beforehand. I don't read them. I don't have any notes. We're just going blind. That's what we do. Okay, so next question. The subject line here on the next queue says Christianity and tobacco. Hey, Mr. Smith, my name is Jeremy Moss. I wanted to email in regards to tobacco use. So I've been dipping for about eight years and I'm 25 years old now. I have struggled quitting and I still have not been able to yet. However, I wanted to pick your brain on the topic. Can you still serve God and follow God wholeheartedly, even if using tobacco or alcohol? I don't drink anymore, only dip. Side note, Love your music, especially the album you did for your movie. Greatest Hits by you and Matthew West is a great song. I've been listening here lately. Uh, please keep up the good work you and Amber do. Brother Jeremy, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the question. It's a good question. It's a solid question. Let's dive in here. Your question is, can you still serve God and follow God wholeheartedly, even if using tobacco or alcohol? Well, um, the short answer is yes, because we are saved by grace through faith. This is not our own doing. It is the work of God so that no man may boast. That comes out of Ephesians 2. And we are not saved by anything that we do or don't do. It is the work of God through grace and our faith, right? Essentially, that's it. You can't add anything or subtract anything from that, but you're talking about serving him. So if you are in faith and you're believing and you're trusting and you see the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of serving God, what are those fruits? Jesus says it many times. You know, that, you know it's, it's almost lost these days in 2023 that there are many commandments in the New Testament. There are commandments, rules, guidelines in the New Testament. Can you believe that? We thought that was just in the Old Testament, but it's not. And we could see the fruits, the greatest of which is love, loving others, serving others, the desire to love others, the desire to feed the sheep, and the desire to shepherd the flock, the desire to, to take God's people and to bring the word to them and hurt for the lost and need need to be able to serve and help to be able to wash someone else's feet. That's what Jesus did. And we're supposed to model that. That is serving him. And you could do that wholeheartedly and also have an addiction. But that is not something you want to stay in. So that's this is sanctification. Now we're talking about as you become a believer and things start to 
shed away as sin starts to peel off of you. You continue to grow. You could serve wholeheartedly at the beginning while you still are in different scenarios of problems around you. But as those things peel off, which they need to, that is a sign that you're being sanctified and you're growing in your faith. So, for instance, I wouldn't look back on on you when you first became a Christian, when you were, let's see, because now you say, I don't drink anymore, right? I wouldn't look back on you when you became born again and you became alive to Christ and you had a beer, I wouldn't say, you're not serving him wholeheartedly yet. I would say, in your current state of sanctification, you're serving him wholeheartedly. But there's so much more to come for you. You just don't know it yet. You're a baby. You are drinking milk, right? This is what Paul says. We, we start with milk, but we need to start eating solid foods soon. What, Granger, what are you talking about? Okay, here's what I'm talking about. I'm diving into your question specifically at the beginning. You said, I have struggled with quitting and I have not been able to yet. That's the problem. You have an addiction that you cannot shake. That is the contradiction you're having right now. That is the stirring you're having. That's why you emailed me. That's why, that's why you are being sanctified in a way that you might not even be able to understand or explain right now. But the reason you emailed me is because you know there's a problem. You're like, man, I got something going on and I can't shake it. It doesn't mean you're not serving God. It just means the Spirit is sanctifying you going, time to shed it. I want you to rely on me. I want all of you. I, will, I don't want part of you. I don't want a little sliver of you. I want all all of you. And I don't have all of you while you're addicted to this. So shake it. And then you go, oh, why do I feel so convicted? That word, right? Why do, why do I feel so guilty? We could feel that like guilt and conviction and it hurts sometimes. And it, this happens with all kinds of things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be written as a sin. Let me give you an example. Last fall, I was sitting there watching Texas A&M football. I was like, man, I get so nervous before a game. I get all stirred up and anxious. And then the game starts and I get angry. And then as the game's going on, I get joyful and then angry again. And the game's over and they lose. And I have a bad night and I'm affected by it. And it started hitting me. This is last fall, guys. It started hitting me. You got a problem. You love college football too much. You're addicted to college football in a way that it is affecting your emotions. And I'm like, really? I, I, know, I recognize that old sanctification feeling. And I told my tour manager, Chris, I was like, man, I think I got to quit college football. He goes, what? I go, yeah, I think I'm feeling convicted to quit college football, to quit watching it until I could rein it in where I could just watch it casually and not be emotionally affected, like where it doesn't just start affecting my daily life. And Chris is like, oh, you think, so you think that I watch college football, so I'm sinning? I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you sinning. This sanctification is different. Okay, so you see how I'm wrapping this all up. So, buddy, you're addicted to anything. I don't care if it's caffeine or, in this case, tobacco. This kind of sanctification is up to you. If you're addicted to caffeine, that's not against the law. But if it's, if it's controlling you in a way that you need it, you have to function, that's a problem. And you got to quit it. Tobacco, it's not illegal. You're old enough to have it. You're 25 years old. You're old enough to buy it. It's not illegal. It's not a problem unless it becomes a problem. I know this problem personally. And I had to quit. I no longer touch it. I could speak to this personally. I had the same conviction you're having now. And I had to kick it. You got me. Let's move on. Next question, subject line says, talking with girls. Hey, Granger, I'd like to stay anonymous. I'm a sophomore in high school. 
I got a girl that I've been talking to for a little while now. She's extreme. She likes me and she wants to date me, but it seems like she's rushing into it. All my friends think that she's cool and she thinks they are cool and all trying to get me to do stuff with her and ask her out. My main problem is I have no idea what to talk about with her right now. I don't know if I'm ready to date her or not. I'm assuming you're very young here. I'm assuming, uh, assuming we're talking, we're talking to a teenager here and you're talking, it's, oh, you said it. You said I'm a sophomore in high school. Okay. So what is that? Sophomore in high school, you're 16, maybe 17. Um, let me hand it to you straight. 16 year old straight. There's a girl you've been talking to. She likes you. She wants to date you. She's rushing into it. All your friends think you should do it because she's cool. Your main problem is you don't know if you're ready or not. The answer is you're not ready. That's it. It doesn't matter what your friends think is cool. It doesn't matter if she likes you a lot. You're not ready. How do you know? Because you said it. I don't know if I'm ready or not. That is the answer that you're not ready. If there's a shadow of a doubt in there, then you're not ready because the essence of being ready is there's no doubt. You're ready. There is no reason to wonder if you're ready or not. You just are. You just know it. You go, man, I like her. No red flags. I'm in. I want to ask her out. I want to talk to her. It doesn't matter if I don't know what to talk to her about. I'm just going to go up and say, I like you. And I don't exactly know how to say it. I don't, I don't really know how to talk. I'm a little embarrassed because you're so pretty. But all I do know is that I like you. I'd like to maybe go on a date with you. But if you're not ready, you don't do that, brother. You don't say that at all. You tell your friends, I ain't ready. Come on, man. She's cool. I'm not ready. Okay, 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 fine, man. We'll lay off. You see her in the hallway. She's talking to you. Just say, I just want to be up front. If you're thinking this is going somewhere like dating, I'm not ready for that. It's not, it's not something that you're doing or not necessarily. I'm just... I'm a little young and I'm not ready. Maybe one day I will be. This is a different story, you know, if you're like 30 years old, 25 years old. But 15, 16, 17, this is different, okay? You're not ready. Let's grab another question. Subject line on this next one, straight into the queue, says, tough decision. Hey, Granger, my name is Ethan. I'm 22 from Colorado. Moved to Colorado a few years ago because I felt like it was the right place to be at the right time. My time here has taught me a whole lot about myself and I've grown on my own these last few years. I'm currently trying to decide if I should move back to Tennessee or not. I don't have as much family here and not a lot of opportunities to go back home and, and see them. Okay, and I don't have a lot of opportunities to go back home and see them, talking about the family, like I thought I was going to be able to. I'm really struggling right now, and I don't know if this is just a season of life or if I'm really starting to dislike it here. I've been praying about it and still confused on what to do. Yee, yee. Ethan. Ethan, thank you, brother. Uh, Appreciate the question, and shout out to Colorado and Tennessee, two beautiful places. Listen, the first thing you got to establish here, Ethan, is that you Make sure this isn't just a wandering heart because 22-year-olds have it. It's it's contagious at 22. I remember having it. And what I'm talking about is just being in a place where you're just not really content where you are. You're searching. And it doesn't matter if it's Colorado or Tennessee or Hong Kong. It doesn't matter. you are not finding your contentment in the place that you're living. I don't know from your email exactly why you moved to Colorado. You just says, it's, your email just says, it felt like it was the right place to be at the time. 
I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means you had a bad breakup in Tennessee. If there was a girl in Colorado you were chasing. I, I don't know if maybe you had a buddy that go to Colorado and you followed him and now he's not there anymore. I don't know, but it doesn't, I, I'm not getting a clear picture by you just saying, I lived in Tennessee and I just moved to Colorado a few years ago because it felt like it was the right place to be at the time. I kind of, if we were riding in the truck together, I, I need to know a little bit more information. So we'll go by what we have. You thought you were going to move to Colorado and be able to go back and see your family a lot. That's what you said. You haven't had those opportunities. You're trying to decide if you should just pack up and move back to Tennessee. Now, we make these things, these situations into huge problems when it's really not. As I'm reading it on the podcast, I'm thinking, this is not a huge problem. It is to you because you're in it. You're in the middle of it. For me on the outside, I'm like, dude, get out of your lease when it ends. Go stay on a couch in Tennessee or at, at your family's house, whatever. And you don't have to do it for 10 years. Just go live on a couch for a month in Tennessee. G get out of your lease in Colorado and you're going to know. You're going to be back in Tennessee going, yeah, this is, this is right. It feels right to be back here. I think through your email, you're leaving. It doesn't feel like Colorado has anything to offer you anymore. And you are saying, I'm struggling right now. I don't know if this is just a season of life or if I'm really starting to dislike it. I'm praying, but it, I still feel very confused. What, what are you praying for? I always like to ask that question. I always like to just at least prick you a little bit and ask you what you're praying for. God, help me to make a decision. Help me to follow my dreams. Like, what are you saying? Because I would recommend it sounds something like, God, you are sovereign. You are present. You are aware. You are purposing. You're planning. You know every hair on my head. You know every star in the sky. I will never question you. God, I feel lost. I feel like I'm searching and I need to put that focus back on you. Draw me to you. Let me see you for who you are. I, I don't know why I get so confused and I, I get so caught up in, in this world and God, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to look to you. Guide me. Let open my eyes to see what is out there. What the doors that are open that I could walk through, and the doors that are closed I need to turn away from. But wherever I go, let it be your will, not mine. If there's someone here in Colorado for me to see and talk to, let let me find them. If there's someone back home in Tennessee I need to be with, let me go to them. But either way, wherever I go, let me find contentment in you. Just wondering, Ethan, if it's anything if if I am even in the ballpark of the prayers that you're praying when you're talking about moving. I don't know. I was once your age and I was living in Tennessee. I'd moved there from Texas. And after four years, I felt a little wild heart and I felt like I needed to go back to Texas. I, like you, didn't get to visit my family that much. I thought I was going to get going to get to see them more and I didn't. I know what you're going through. I feel this. Go back to your home state. That's where you belong. But pray a prayer of wisdom to God that it's not your will, it's his. Surrender, give it over to him. Things will get better. All right? Love you guys.
See you next Monday. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel. Hit that little like button and the notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. If you have a question for me that you would like me to answer, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Yee-yee.